Welcome to another River Landing Conversation with Helen Shields, and I'm Jim Kalaki, and we are delighted to be able to join you um, this afternoon. Um, we are especially glad to welcome Dick Witt, Thank who's you. a resident at River Landing and has um, all sorts of wonderful stories that we're <laughs> going to hear over the next half hour or so. Um, Dick lives here with his wife, Lou, who's in the audience. Lou, good afternoon. Glad you're here. And um, we're also joined today by Sydney Sparing, who is our engineer, producer, and um, making sure we're coming across sounding hopefully more or less OK. Um, again, Lou, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to come and be with us. Um, I should mention this is our last uh, session for the fall semester. Um, we did have two others scheduled, but due to scheduling and other issues, uh, they have been uh, put off until a future date. We'll have more about that um, later on. Helen, welcome. Thank Kick you. Kick us off <laughs> again. People here and friends throughout your life have called you Dick. Yeah. Is Richard your given name? And was there anything in your family that brought about that name? And how do you like that name? Uh, my given name is Dickey, D-I-C-K-E-Y, middle name Wayne. Uh, and there is a story as to why uh, I think that's my name was given, but um, I'm not real sure, but I'll get into that a little bit later. But as I, as, I, as I grew up, most of the time, family, church, people, neighborhood people call me Dickie Wayne. Um, <laughs> and as I got older, it became Dickie. Uh, as I become a teenager, it became Dick. And uh, it stuck uh, with Dick. So um, I'm happy with that name. Uh, my mom and dad gave it to me, so uh, I don't think I'd change it. So. Okay. Dick, where were you born, and where did you grow up, and what do you think of as home? <clears throat> uh, Jim, I, I grew up in <clears throat> Greensboro. <clears throat> I actually grew up in the <clears throat> Mill Village of White Oak. Uh, and I don't know if you know the story of Carl Mills or not, but uh, Moses and... Uh, said Moses and Caesar Cohn uh, were originally from Maryland, and uh, they uh, they were involved in the grocery store business, and so they uh, did well, and so they uh, purchased some land north of Greensboro at that time, and uh, they came down and they created really four villages. They had a White Oak, a proximity, a print work, and a revolution. And each, uh, each little village uh, was their own entity. Uh, they had their own, uh, I consider White Oak had the first, really the first shopping center in Greensboro, really. Uh, they, had a, they had a post office, a, uh, a grocery store, an insurance agency, a doctor's office, a drug store, a restaurant, uh, a dry cleaners, <laughs> uh, American Legion bed over topside, on one corner, they had what they called a company store, uh, which you could go in and buy just all kinds of things. Beside of it, uh, there was a, what they called the White Oak Hotel, uh, which was really an a upscale place for the community. And then beside that was a recreation center. And so uh, that's where I grew up. That's what I consider home. Uh, and I live most of my life uh, every other day at the recreation center. <laughs> and I say every other day because mom would give me a 9.30 curfew and I'd get home at 10. And so I'd ground her the next night. So, <laughs> so I'd have every other day, I'd, I'd be at the rec center. Uh, but I stayed out of trouble. I, I enjoyed uh, playing sports and sports had been my life. So there you have it. That's home, Greensboro. Quite open. Indeed. Indeed. You'll be yeah. Uh, mo most of us here have moved around quite a bit before we ended up at River Landing. Where did you move throughout your life? 
Uh, actually, I was pretty much homebody in Greensboro, except uh, I joined the Marine Corps uh, in 1961. Um, <clears throat> rode a bus down to uh, Raleigh. They swore me in, put me on a train to MC, South Carolina. And I got off that train with my little ditty bag and my hand in my pocket. And <laughs> this guy came out and said some words to me that I'd never heard before. <laughs> and and put, put me in a put me in a, a, a room with a, a bunch of racks, bed racks, single bed racks, and we sit at attention for four hours uh, while we were waiting on another train out of the north to get in. Uh, it was a different environment, totally. So uh, I spent time at Camp Lejeune, uh, Norfolk, back to Camp Lejeune. They had asked me in, in the Norfolk uh, after I got out of... Uh, school, and, and they sent me, uh, I, I like to call it Diddy Bopper. Uh, I was a Morse code operator. So um, I sat there for six months, and I received Morse code and, uh, for four hours, and I sent Morse code for four hours. And um, so from, from there, they asked me where I wanted to go, and I gave them several uh, foreign, foreign uh, places that I'd like to go, Japan, Hawaii, other Asian uh, places, and uh, they sent me back to Lejeune. <laughs> uh, so I get back to Lejeune, and they asked me, uh, uh, I met this guy that had dated, actually dated uh, my wife's second cousin, and uh, I'd been in radio platoon, I guess, for about six months, and he said, how would you like to work in operation for six months? I said, fine, anything to get me out of the out of a radio platoon and going out on bib wax every night. So uh, I went into operations and uh, I planned what the radio platoon was going to do and uh, drove the XO. And they changed XOs a lot. They changed them about every six months, every year. So in changing them, when a new one came in, they didn't want to get a new guy in operations. So uh, they, uh, they asked me to uh, stay on. So I stayed, I stayed there my entire career hmm. for four years. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, drove the XO and uh, planned operations. <laughs> Never used my MOS, <laughs> which is really a shame, but I did. So then we, I came back home. I had met Lou uh, way back. She was a 14-year-old ninth grader when I met Lou. And uh, I knew the day I saw her uh, that I was going to marry her at some time. And uh, it took me six years, but we got married in 65, so we're almost 58, 58 years, I think. 58, 68, 50, 50, 57 now. So, um, and then we're back home. Well, we uh, actually got married uh, in, in 65, uh, bought a house trailer, and uh, lived in a house trailer for a while, and then we uh, bought, a, uh, bought a, our first home. And in 1971, we bought another home, a new home in the northeast section, lived there 42 years, moved from there to High Point, and then from High Point here. So pretty much, mm -hmm. other than my my tenure in, in service, uh, Greensboro, High Point, Colfax. So if anyone needs to learn anything about directions around High Point, be glad to help them. Or yeah. Absolutely, Greensboro, you'll be you'll be uh, more more than happy to help. Them. Absolutely, right. absolutely. Well, as you know, um, the people here have all kinds of amazing backgrounds and skills and experiences and so on. Tell us a little bit about your, your work life and your sort of hobby life um, as you came out of the Marines and, and got, um, as we used to say when I was in the Army, life after the Army. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> life after. Uh, well, while I was in service, uh, I, I took some classes in East Carolina which was a uh, on-campus type classes. Mm -hmm. I knew uh, when, when I went in service, uh, quite frankly, I went in service because 
I had no clue what I wanted to do with my life. I really didn't. Uh, I, I was not a very good high school student, quite frankly. Uh, and the, the less I, I could get by with, the better off I felt about it. <laughs> uh, that's just, you know, that was the name of the game. Uh -huh. um, so I went in service and uh, I got out and I still wasn't real sure. And uh, Lou and I got married and I got a job with the city as a uh, magistrate. I issued warrants. A uh, magistrate, uh, warrant deputy. Oh, I worked oh, with the police okay. department, yeah. and uh, somebody come in and, uh, um, and wanted to get a warrant. They come see me, and I would issue the warrant. Uh, and uh, then uh, I decided, uh, no, I didn't really want to do that at all. You know, that wasn't me. And so uh, I entered uh, 1968. I entered. Uh, I had taken some night college uh, courses at, at Guilford College. And uh, so in 1968, I decided, uh, along with Lou, that it was time for me to get serious about an education. So uh, I went to Guilford uh, year-round for uh, three years and got my degree in health and physical education and, uh, and sports. And during that time, uh, I took some classes that, you know, having been out of school for a long time. And I met this guy in biology a really, really great guy that lived pretty much in the area that, that we lived. And uh, we became really, really good friends. And uh, so good that we actually, uh, we took the fetal pig apart on our dining room table. Uh, Lou, Lou, Lou really didn't appreciate that, but we did. Uh, uh, and he asked, uh, uh, he, he was a, a baseball person. And he was uh, going to coach uh, uh, a 15, 16-year-old year uh, program. And he asked me if I would help him. And I said, sure, I'd love to help him. And so I got involved in that and, uh, uh, for a year. And uh, I really liked it, and he didn't. So uh, the next year, he said, I'm not going to do it anymore. And uh, so I took it. And uh, uh, that began my uh, real uh, uh, serious uh, commitment to Pony Baseball. And um, so uh, I, I did that for a number of years, and I had another mentor uh, that I would consider. Uh, he approached me one day. He was a region director, and he was in charge of all the 15- and 16-year-old programs uh, in the area. And when I say area, it was North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, Virginia, uh, Maryland, Eastern Shore, and Eastern Tennessee. And he asked me if I would do it. And I said, well, I've, done, I've coached for five or six years uh, in the program. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd do it. So uh, I moved over. Uh, I, in fact, I had to go to Baltimore, Maryland to meet with the vice president of the Pony uh, to get the job. I had to be interviewed to get a volunteer job, <laughs> <laughs> which was OK. <clears throat> but. Uh, we, uh, uh, it started off there and, and it ended up there. Uh, for people that don't know, Pony is an international baseball organization that uh, consists of uh, two year age groups. And it started with 15, 16, uh, 13, 14. And then they went 15, 16, back down 11 and 12. And now we run the gamut, three through 21. Wow. Uh, and I spent 51 years with their organization. And, uh, uh, I, I, you know, there's a lot of controversy in baseball, and uh, we have a lot of people that uh, didn't last as long as I did. Uh, they either uh, got mad and quit, or they <laughs> got fired from the volunteer job, or they passed, <laughs> they passed away. Uh, you know, they liked it so well, they stayed until the, to the end. And... Uh, so I, I, I ran the, uh, I was approached once. I had, to, I had to wait my turn to go up the ladder. Uh, there's a, a vice president, there's a division director, and then there's a region director. And so I was region director for a long time. And the vice president retired, and my division director moved up. So I moved up to the division director. Uh, I ran the uh, Pony World Series for 17 years, um, 
as a tournament director. Uh, the countless hours that you spend on the phone and uh, recruiting teams and having meetings with your subordinates, if you want to call them that, or I just call them people I work with, uh, takes an enormous amount of time. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I couldn't have done it without the help of Lou, who really supported me in all of this and sort of just gave up her time. Uh, I can't tell you the ball games that she sat through. Mm. I mean, I do a I do a Pony World Series tournament, and we played two games on Friday, three games on Saturday, uh, three games on Sunday, four games on Monday, four games on Tuesday, one or two or three games on Wednesday, and she sits through every one of those games. Uh, could I have done it without? My responsibility? I don't think so. <laughs> but but she did. Uh, but uh, that was an important part of my life, uh, 51 years of, uh, of volunteering uh, with Pony. Uh, but another part of my hobbies and what I enjoyed doing when I was uh, at Guilford, uh, I met this guy that, that I had gone to church with. I grew up Baptist, and... Uh, when Lou and I got married, I became Presbyterian. And so I'm the black sheep of my family, which is, that's, that's okay. That's okay. But uh, this guy that uh, worked for WCOG Radio, he did all the uh, Guilford basketball and football games. And so uh, he was looking for someone to do the st uh, statistics for him. And so he approached me and asked me if I would do it. And I said, absolutely. So we got involved, Lou and I. Uh, again, she followed around with me. Uh, got involved in that, in, in that, and for I guess six years, even after I started teaching school, um, we did that on, on at night at the sideline. We traveled all over the country, uh, watching Gifford play basketball and football. Uh, they lost a lot of games in football. In fact, they lost thirty-one consecutive games mm. in, fo in football, <laughs> and we sat through every one of them. Uh, <laughs> But uh, they I guess whether you're winning or losing, there we, are statistics. We sit there there is and data. He, he kept the stats. Uh, we had a great time. Uh, uh, I, I love the guy I worked with. Uh, we we traveled a, a lot. To Lou and I. In fact, <clears throat> we didn't have much, we didn't have hardly anything you know, growing up, quite frankly. And um, I had a '64 Volkswagen, and we had bought a. Uh, 63, I believe, 63 uh, uh, Corvair. And uh, so they were, Gifford was going to Kansas City to play in the NAIA tournament, and we really wanted to go. So we sold the Corvair uh, to buy tickets so we could go, <laughs> you know, so we could go to uh, so we could go to Kansas City and watch them play. And they played, and in that tournament they played uh, thirty two games uh, from Tuesday to Saturday. Wow! And I saw thirty of them. Wow! So mm. that was worth it. Think of the in the pony leagues, like let's just say around Greensboro. Yeah. How many teams would you have had? Oh. And how many? And how far away would teams travel to play? Was it was it all fairly local until you got to? Sort of the end of season competition. It actually starts. We started with a district tournament. Yeah. You have a district tournament of, of people in, in your hometown. Uh, they play, and the winner of that tournament will go to a section tournament, which is would be considered North Carolina. I see. And so North Carolina would play, and the winner of that tournament would go to a region. The region was would encompass uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, Maryland Eastern Shore, and East mm -hmm. Tennessee. Uh, the winner of that tournament would go to a zone, and the zone, uh, each zone consisted of three sections, three different locations. We had a north zone, a south zone, and a west zone. Uh, then they would play, and the winner of that would go to the World Series. Wow. So just, brackets on top of brackets and on top yeah. of brackets, mm -hmm. logistics. Yeah, and you had to have you had to have hosts that would be willing to uh, support uh, those tournaments. And that was, uh, that was a challenge in itself. In fact, Greensboro, for 15 years, 
they had, uh, we had uh, what we call the Greensboro Palomino group, which was the uh, 17 and 18. And we had a man that took that job really, really serious. And uh, we ran uh, the Colt, I mean, the uh, Palomino World Series for 15 years. Wow. And he had to have, you know, he had to have, I mean, he bringing teams in from Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Japan, uh, mm. uh, Korea, South Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it takes an enormous amount of money. Uh, and, and the host is expected to pay part of that. And so you got to have you got to have donations and sponsors mm -hmm. that's willing to put up that kind of money. Interesting. And you were a teacher. I, um, I, I <laughs> should I dare say your day job <laughs> or your, or your <laughs> night job? Depending. Yeah, I started teaching in 1971, uh -huh. and I taught for five years at uh, Jackson Junior High School. And in fact, uh, there, there is a gentleman here that I coached with uh, that live here that lives here now. And uh, we had uh, three guys, and we really got along really well. Uh, super, super guys. And uh, But after five years, I decided that's not really Dick. Uh, yeah, I, I wasn't happy. Uh, I was spending a lot of time uh, at school, uh, not only in sports, uh, but also uh, working for the city at night where they played their basketball leagues mm -hmm. at Jackson. And so I'd go in at 6.30 in the morning and get home at 12 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. And that just got you know, a little bit much. So I started looking, and uh, there was opening with uh, Parks and Rec and, and going back all the way back to the Recreation Center days, which I was talking about growing up. Uh, I had a real mentor uh, that always looked after me and took care of me. And uh, when, I, when I first started teaching, uh, during the summer times, we only, it was nine months of the year. So during the summer, we had to find a job. So he had me run uh, his uh, playground program. And in those days, we had 50 supervised playgrounds in Greensboro. 50, a lot of, an enormous amount of playgrounds. And uh, they had two people working at every playground. And so uh, that kept me pretty busy for during the summertime. So when a job opened up, at, uh, it opened up at Lewis Recreation Center. And uh, I applied and I got the job. And uh, I worked there for, uh, uh, I guess, maybe a year and a half. And then they opened the new center at Trotter. And they asked me to go open that up. So I worked there for a while. And then the, my supervisor asked me to come in and be her assistant. So I stepped up and was supervisor of all the recreation centers. And then in uh, the early 80s, I guess, uh, they made the rule made changes and they needed an athletic director, so I moved over to athletics. And uh, so all of this was in, in connection with my pony, and, mm -hmm. and which was permissible, and they supported it, so I was able to stay with that. And then uh, I ended up, uh, I created a uh, safety program for Parks and Rec, uh, pesticide, uh, playground equipment, uh, on and on, say, defensive driving. I taught, taught defensive driving for five or six years. And but probably, quite frankly, probably could offer one here and it would probably go over because I've seen a lot of people driving around here. Uh, they avoid stop signs. And, uh, our, our our speed limit signs, I think, should be moved a little bit. I, I think they're in the wrong position. Mm -hmm. so, so that's just a personal opinion. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, so and so after 33 years, I retired from the city uh, in 1998. But I stayed with uh, Pony until uh, 2018. Wow. So then I hung it all up. That along with you know what I. What we did in our, our church, you know, we went on mission trips, um, I taught Sunday school class. I was a clerk of session for probably 30 years. Um, we had a full life. Sounds like it, yes. <laughs> in your spare time, did you ever listen to music? <laughs> <laughs> 
And what is your favorite kind of music, or do you have a favorite uh, song? Uh, favorite songs, I have many. Uh, music, I like all music, uh, but my heart belongs to classic country. Oh. Uh, uh, I, I mean, that's the music I grew up with. Uh, I grew up with uh, a, a lot of rock and roll. Uh, so I, Lou and I were privileged to actually see Elvis three times in Greensboro. Mm -hmm. uh, not a lot of people were able to do that, but... Uh, and then, uh, as we were talking beforehand, uh, uh, I met this guy on 297 on Saturday night, <laughs> Daniel O'Donnell, and, and I really like his music. Uh, so I like all kinds of music, and uh, it just depends. We play, we play all kinds of music when we travel. So. At the risk of sounding uh, a little ethnically biased, Mr. O'Donnell is one of the foremost Irish tenors now, and... Uh, so he I've, is very, I've just been introduced to he is, he is 297. Very, he is very good. On, he is very good. Saturday Every nights. Saturday night. Every Saturday <laughs> night, yeah. Well, um, Dick, you've, you've told us a rich background. Um, is there anything that, um, as people who know you or, or people are getting to know you here at River Landing, might not know about you or might not just sort of guess about you that you might want to, to share. Jim, uh, I really think we covered it all. If there's anything like that, it would probably need to be done one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have a favorite Riverlanding experience or two that you could share with us? Well, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, a couple of things. Uh, one, Statler Brothers did a song years ago called Small, Small World. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I can't believe how small this world is because you meet people here uh, and there's a connection somewhere down the road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, to me, it's absolutely amazing that you meet people that, that you connect with way back and didn't know it. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, I, I would say that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is uh, how, how much people here like candy. <laughs> uh, I, well, I, well you know, I call bingo uh, once a month, uh, uh, every, five, every fifth time, uh, Lou and I call. And, um, and, and, of course, we come and support the other callers. And people are... Uh, they are mad about winning a bar of candy. <laughs> it's, a, it's amazing. So, other than that, I, th I think that covers pretty much it. <laughs> I mean, hey, people need to come to bingo, that's all. <laughs> Have a good time. <laughs> Dick, if the details were taken care of, um, who are three people in all of time, or four people or two, that you might like to sit and have a visit with or a meal with? Well, I, <clears throat> in thinking about that, I didn't think about that. I think uh, I'd like to go back and, and have a meal with my dad. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad uh, uh, talked very little about his life uh, with me or, or anybody. And my dad had lost two brothers by the time he was 22. Mm -hmm. He lost one. Uh, he had one brother that was three years older than he, and he died uh, of, a, of a, a ruptured appendix at 16. Mm -hmm. And he had another brother killed in Italy uh, in uh, July of 44. That's where I think my name comes from. His name was actually Irving Cletus. And... Uh, my dad had sent him a letter, and uh, he came back because Cletus had gotten killed uh, before the letter had mm -hmm. gotten there. And so uh, my aunt had a copy of that, uh, had that letter, and she was going through, she didn't know she had it. This is five, this is about five years yes. ago, five, six years ago. 
And she called me one day. She said, I've got a letter you need to have. And so I got the letter. And in the letter, uh, Dad called Cletus. He called him Dick about seven or eight times. And I, and I finished the letter, and I'm, I'm talking to my aunt. And I said, did other people call Cletus Dick? She said, oh, yeah, everybody called him Dick. And so I'm assuming that that's where my name came from. Mm -hmm. So Dad and Cletus are two, but I'm going to throw a curve. I would like to come back to 50 years. I have someone that I consider uh, our godson who just entered uh, Frost Music School at the University of Florida. And he's going to be a jazz musician, and he is so talented. So I'd like to come back uh, in about 50 years and have a meal with him and talk with him about his I life. I need, I need. So uh, that's just uh, off the top of my head. Good. <laughs> well, there, that I'm aware of, um, this studio doesn't have any bookings 50 years, <laughs> 50 years down the road. So you sh you'll probably be able to get a room without, without too much problem. And, uh, oh, what a great idea. Neat. So. Do you have one or two or more favorite river landing experiences since you've gotten here? You know, I, we talked about the connections and uh, talked about candy. That's, I guess that, that covers it pretty much. You know, being confined for as much as we were when we first moved in, and hopefully, uh, hoping that we are going to be uh, opening up a little bit more as we get mm -hmm. further down the road a little bit. But meeting meeting the people and and and, yeah. the, and the friendliness of the people, I think, is uh, you, you never meet a stranger. I mean, you know, everybody is so open, mm -hmm. and and so that's a. Uh, I think as you get older, you don't realize uh, that you're going to be able to meet uh, the people that you meet and become friends with them like you do. So uh, mm -hmm. from that standpoint, that, that's the biggest thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Did you know much about River Landing, given that you're local, um, before you came here? Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There was never any doubt. Yeah, once we decided uh, that... You know, Lou and I have no natural children, so uh, we consider everybody that we ever taught or or had in Sunday yeah. school or anything. The coach, they're mine. So if somebody asks me how many kids I got, I say three, four thousand. Uh, so and, and I'm being honest. Uh, I, I've got people. Uh, I got friends on Facebook now that that I taught in junior high school in 1971. Wow. So uh, I feel very honored to have that, but. Uh, no. Um, and finally, are there any questions that you thought about before we started the conversation that haven't come up or that you expected to no. either address or be asked? No, I think I think you've uh, you've covered the gamut. <laughs> so great. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. And, like it. and, uh, and what a what a an amazing, you know, three thousand or more legacies oh, that, that you've helped to create with love my uh, kids, with kids all love over kids. the all absolutely. over the country, and and I suspect in other parts of the world too. Yep. With teams from overseas. Yeah, I have friends from uh, all over the world. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, this has been a terrific addition to well, our conversation you. series. Well, thank um, you, Jim. Thank you and Helen for having me. Thank you so much. Helen, thank you for this lovely semester of <laughs> conversations. As I mentioned, um, this is our final program for this semester. Um, our plans at the moment are to renew the conversations uh, with residents and senior staff next fall. Um, there are um, brewing conversations, let's say, um, about some surprises that we may um, um, be able to land with in the spring. And as they emerge, 
you will get to hear more about those. In the meantime, thank you. Thank you to Sydney. Thank you to Brian, who's uh, <coughs> away for this session, but for the two of them for getting us on the air um, every week in a timely fashion and an audible fashion, <laughs> um, which wasn't always the case in our, in our first year or two. Um, but this has been a lovely series. And again, thank you to those of you who've um, watched and to those of you who've taken the time to let us know how we're doing. Um, it's always been very gratifying to have either a note or a hallway conversation about um, an opinion, a suggestion, um, or a compliment. So with that, we bid you good afternoon and enjoy the rest of um, 2021. Absolutely. Thank you.